بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد uh, So today's lesson will be the last lesson of our series of Umar bin Khattab And as we did for Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, we're going to do something very different, very atypical And it's not going to be a biography at all uh, As we did for Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, I thought it would just be interesting uh, Just have a little bit, a bit of a diversion as well And to enter into a different discipline And that is the discipline of actual ahadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam And so what we're going to do is we're just going to have a selection uh, Maybe 30, 40, 50, as much as we can do Of the ahadith that Umar ibn Khattab narrated Now Abu Bakr al-Siddiq uh, he narrated as we had mentioned around a hundred or so ahadith we managed to cover pretty much most of them in that one halaqa that we did we covered pretty much almost all of the essential ones as for Umar ibn Khattab we cannot do that because Umar ibn Khattab he as we know ruled for 10 years and his number of ahadith is as Ibn al-Mulaqin said 539 ahadith have been reported from Umar ibn Khattab so there's no way in our class we can do 539 hadith so what I've done I just have a miscellaneous selection and uh, there is no uh, there's no order, we're not doing aqidah and fiqh and tafsir, it's not, it's just basically I'm taking a standard book and I introduced this book last time, Musnad of Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal, which is one of the largest collections of ahadith, it has around 35,000 ahadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and it is arranged according to the Sahaba and so it makes my life easier, I just go to the Musnad of Umar. Now, as I said last time, as a refresher for all of us, Musnad Imam Ahmed is not arranged according to topics. Unlike Sahih Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, unlike Sunan Abi Dawood, unlike all of the other books which are arranged according to topic, Musnad books, there's a genre of hadith called Musnad. Musnad books are arranged according to, according to whom? Companions. companions. They're arranged according to Sahaba, companions. They're not arranged according to topics. So if you wanted to look up a topic, you wouldn't be looking it up in Musnad Imam Ahmad. That's not why you would turn to Musnad Imam Ahmad. Musnad Imam Ahmad is not meant for topics. It's meant as a compilation of the ahadith of every companion. And therefore, we'll be doing miscellaneous. It's going to be completely, completely uh, different, if you like, uh, uh, ahadith uh, that are not directly related to one another. So, let us begin. Uh, let us begin with, uh, one, uh, with the hadith of... Uh, uh, we begin with the hadith of uh, Amr al-Bajali who narrated from Ibn al-Khattab that they came to Umar ibn al-Khattab and they said that O oh, Amir al-Mu'mineen we want to ask you three questions so again what's interesting about these things is we get a glimpse of incidents in the life of Umar and we also get a glimpse of the hadith he narrated so when he's Amir al-Mu'mineen people come and say we have three questions number one Tell us, is it allowed for a man to pray in his house? Nafil prayer. Number two, tell us about ghusl al-janaba, how it is done and when it is done. And number three, tell us about uh, what is allowed uh, when uh, the woman is in her hayd, what is allowed for us and what is not allowed. So he said that, are you magicians? Because these exact three questions, I also happen to ask them to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam And you are now asking me them after I happen to ask him as well Now he's not saying I asked the three questions in one gathering He's saying I asked these same questions and here you are coming and asking the exact same question So he was astonished So he said I heard the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say Salatu rajuli fi baytihi tatawwa'an nur Faman sha'a nawwara baytahu Praying the nafil prayer in your house is a light. So whoever wants, let him increase his light. So in other words, pray in your house as much as you want as well. So it's good to pray in your house. And I heard the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam about Janaba. How does one do Janaba, ghusl from Janaba? So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Let him wash his private organ, then let him do wudu. Then let him pour water on his head three times. Now remember they didn't have showers back then. So they would have to uh, take buckets of water and put it on themselves. And by pouring water on the head what is meant is to immerse the whole body in water. So you wash the private organ and then you do wudu. And the wudu washes the limbs that, of the wudu. Then by pouring water on the self the rest of the body is washed. And then as for the woman in the hayd, the Prophet ﷺ said, لَهُ مَا فَوْقَ الْإِزَارِ Everything above the izar, 
everything above the lower garment is something that uh, he can uh, take pleasure from. So in other words, the one act is not allowed and everything else is allowed. So this is one hadith that we will do. Another hadith of Ibn Umar, he said that once I saw Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas doing wiping over his khuf, wiping over his leather socks when he was in Iraq after he did wudu. So I said to him, what is this? How could you not be wiping, sorry, how could you not be washing your feet? How can you be wiping over the socks? So he remained quiet. Then when we returned to Medina and we were with my father Umar ibn al-Khattab, he said to me, go ask your father about the same matter that you criticized me for, meaning the wiping over the socks. So I went to my father, I told him the whole story. The story was that I didn't agree with wiping over the socks. And so Umar ibn al-Khattab, my father said to me, whenever Sa'ad tells you anything or you see anything from him, don't doubt it. And indeed the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa wiped over his khuffain, wiped over his socks. So again, interesting point here, Ibn Umar uh, doesn't know that you can wipe over the socks and he gets frustrated at Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas and Umar ibn Khattab says, who are you to rebuke Sa'ad? Sa'ad is more knowledgeable than you. Next time Sa'ad does something, don't rebuke him. And then he says, and I saw with my own eyes the Prophet sallallahu wiping over the uh, socks. Uh, the next hadith, that once Umar ibn Khattab stood on the minbar on Friday and he gave the khutbah, he praised Allah and he mentioned the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the good things and he mentioned Abu Bakr and his time. Then he said, I saw a dream and the only interpretation I have is that my death is near. Remember we talked about this hadith last week and it is in Muslim Imam Ahmad. I saw, what was the dream, who can remind me? Well that was another dream. That I saw a rooster pecking me twice and it was reddish in color. And I went to Asma bint Umais, the wife of Abu Bakr, meaning he, Abu Bakr is dead, so his widow, and I asked her to interpret the dream for me. So he's going to Asma bint Umais, by the way, so he's going to a lady to get a fatwa. And this is Umar bin Khattab. And this shows you there's no, there's no problem going to a, a lady for, who's more knowledgeable. Asma bint Umais was of the earliest of the Muhajirat. She has so much knowledge and of dreams, Umar assumed that she had more knowledge. And I asked, uh, Asma bint Umais, this interpretation. So she said, one of the Ajam will assassinate you. And who assassinated him? One of the Ajam. Abu Lu'lu. One of the Ajam assassinated him, right? And perhaps reddish color because reddish was the color of Sassanid empire. Perhaps, Allahu alam. Okay? So one of the Ajam will assassinate you. By the way, he's saying this on the khutbah. So he has a premonition. It's going to happen. And in the khutbah he said, People are commanding me to choose someone after me. But I know that Allah will not cause his religion to be lost, nor will he allow the message of the Prophet Sallallahu to be lost. And if it so happens that my death comes uh, unexpectedly, then these six people, and he pointed to them and I gave their names last time, will have the deciding uh, factor and these are the six that the Prophet ﷺ died and he was pleased with all six of them. So whoever is chosen amongst them, take him as your leader and listen to him and uh, obey him. And uh, then he goes on and he mentions that uh, one issue that I was always troubled with, he said, was the issue of Kalala. The issue of Kalala is when a person dies uh, without having ascendance and descendants. This is a kalala issue, it's called. And Umar al-Khattab said that I tried to ask the Prophet about it and he passed away before he answered me and I don't know what is the ruling. So just stick with Surah An-Nisa. It's an advanced issue of inheritance. And he's basically saying, I don't have an answer that satisfies me. So stick with the generalities of Surah An-Nisa. Um, and then, uh, uh, he, and then uh, the, the, the narrator said, he gave the khutbah on Friday and he was assassinated on Wednesday. Okay, so this was the last khutbah that he gave, that he predicted the, his own assassination, and he was then killed on the Wednesday. Uh, the next hadith that Abdullah ibn Umar, his son, narrates, that uh, we went out, myself and a Zubayr and al-Miqdad ibn al-Aswad, uh, to uh, Khaybar, and remember what is Khaybar? 
It was when the uh, Yahud had given to the Prophet ﷺ and the Muslims had inherited certain sections of it. And we went to take care of our money, our properties over there. And while I was sleeping, I was attacked. This is Abdullah ibn Umar. I was attacked and uh, my hands were injured and uh, basically uh, wounded and bruised. And, the ne and, and apparently he was tied up as well. We learned from other books that he was basically caught there. So my two companions found me in the morning and they said, who has done this to you? So he said, I don't know. It was at night. La adri. I don't know. So they took me back to Medina and my wounds basically were still there. And so Umar ibn Khattab stood up to give a khutbah and he said, O oh people, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam put the condition on the people of Khaybar that we are allowed to continue that pact with them as long as we wanted. And if we wanted, we could rescind the pact and the treaty. And they have attacked my son Abdullah ibn Umar and you see what they have done to him. So he was still uh, wounded. And they have also done uh, something to one of the Ansar. We don't know what, I don't remember this incident, what it is, I can't tell you. But the hadith basically says they have also harmed one of the Ansar. And therefore, uh, from now on, we are going to res uh, dissolve the treaty. And I will get rid of them from that land. And so he asked them to leave Khaybar and they had to go to other lands. It is said they went to Iraq or other places. So this was when the uh, Yahud of Khaybar were asked to leave because the Prophet ﷺ uh, had that treaty and covenant with them. But in the treaty, and we talked about it in the seerah, in the treaty it clearly said that we have the right to renew every year and it's up to basically us to renew it. And so Umar um al-Khattab cancelled the next year because they had harmed, uh, they had harmed uh, the, the, the Muslims who own property over there. Uh, the next hadith of Abu Huraira that he narrates that Umar ibn Khattab was one day giving the khutbah, uh, Yawm al Jum'ah, when a man entered. Now pause here. Abu Huraira does not mention his name, and that is out of Haya. In reality, this man, we learn from other narrations, is none other than Uthman ibn Affan. When a man entered late while Umar was giving the khutbah, so Umar interrupted the khutbah and said, What has delayed you from? coming to the prayer. I mean, you should not be late, meaning Uthman, you, don't, you should not be late. What has delayed you from coming to the uh, prayer? So Uthman said that as soon as I heard the adhan, and he, was in the, and he was in the marketplace buying and selling, as soon as I heard the adhan, I rushed home, did wudu, and came here. So of course he's going to be late because in the time of Umar, how many adhans were there? One adhan for Jumu'ah. Okay, so as soon as I heard the adhan, I rushed home, did wudu, and came to the prayer. So, Umar ibn al-Khattab said, In addition to being late, you only did wudu. I heard the Prophet ﷺ say, whoever goes to pray Jumu'ah, let him do a ghusl. End of hadith. Now, it's interesting here because he's irritated that somebody as noble as Uthman is not following excellence. And when Uthman became the Khalifa, what did Uthman do? Uthman was the one who introduced two adhans. He had basically learned his lesson. He was the one who introduced two adhans. The first adhan was given, where? In the marketplace. The first adhan was given in the marketplace. And the second adhan followed after 10-15 minutes in the Musalla area. Because Uthman himself fell prey to this, that he was busy to the very end in the marketplace. He hears the adhan, so then he rushes home, does wudu, comes, of course he's going to miss half the khutbah. So he decided in his era to institute a new adhan. And this is why in many masajid to this day, there are two adhans. And whoever has two is good, whoever has one that's good. Uh, and, and the reality is, if you really want to have two, it would make sense to have two in places where you need to stop buying and selling because that's the point of the first adhan. In any case, it's not a big deal. In many Muslim societies, you have two adhans for Jumu'ah and it's not a big deal because the first adhan will say, oh, let's get ready, let's quickly leave for the prayer. So I don't see a problem personally because now we have microphones. So the point is the microphone will tell the people that it's almost time for Jumu'ah, get ready and come to the masjid. I don't see a problem if you have two adhans. Some people are very strict and they say, oh, if you want to do a two adhans, the first one has to be in the marketplace. Well. With microphones, everybody hears it. So it kind of does the job. In any case, inshallah, it's all, uh, it's all um, fine. 
Uh, the next hadith we'll do, again, for those who came late, we're just doing a hadith uh, of Umar as we had done a hadith of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. Uh, the next hadith we'll do that, uh, that Abu Uthman narrates that while we were in Azerbaijan, and Azer Azerbaijan uh, basically was conquered in the time of Umar, Umar ibn Khattab's letter came to us, and he said to us that, I caution you from living two luxurious lives. Careful. Don't immerse yourselves in pleasures and big buildings and whatnot. Live simple lives. I caution you from luxury. And I caution you from changing your uh, clothes to the clothes of the people of shirk. Wear your, be proud of who you are. And I caution you against wearing silk. Because the Prophet ﷺ forbade us from wearing silk except for small quantities. And uh, the hadith says he raised his finger or two fingers. So Umar al-Khattab is the one, by the way, in Sahih Muslim, he has the narration that it is not allowed, uh, or the Prophet forbade us from wearing silk except for a finger or two or three or four. Literally, that's what the hadith says. Meaning, strips and patches of silk are permissible, but not an entire garment of silk. That men, as we know in our Sharia, ah, men should not wear full shirts of silk or suits of silk. Women, of course, it is permissible. But men should not wear this. That is something that we want in Jannah. It is not something that uh, our Prophet allowed us in this world. However, a bit of silk is allowed. And in those days, uh, and it, this is going into a fiqh here, but that's why we're doing these hadith to understand them. In those days, if you wanted to decorate a garment, the garment would not be blended or would not be cut and then put together. You would literally cut a strip and put a decoration onto it. That's how you would decorate a shirt. The patterns and designs were not dyed in, they weren't that advanced. So they would literally cut, or they would just have patches of designs onto it. And so our Prophet is saying, patches of silk on a real garment of wool or whatever is permissible. So based on this, a percentage of silk in the garment is okay. That is not more than a, a, a large quantity. What is large quantity? There's no number that comes in the Sharia. But if it's a, a little bit of silk, it is permissible. As well, ties as well would be considered permissible because tie is not an entire garment. A tie is basically the three, four fingers. Basically, it's an accessory. And so this is a decoration. And it's not the actual shirt or the suit. So in those days, they'd have the patches. In our days, we have the tie. So it is completely permissible for a Muslim man to wear a 100% silk tie. There's nothing uh, uh, even makruh about this because it is permissible to have decorations of silk. It is impermissible to have the entire shirt or suit or whatever made out of silk. Um, the next hadith that we'll do, uh, that Abu Sinan al-Du'ali says that once he visited Umar ibn Khattab and he was sitting in a gathering of the senior muhajirun and a carpet or rug came to him from Iraq with the ghanima of Iraq and it was opened up with all of the ghanima in it and one of the children of Umar ibn Khattab picked up a ring and began to play with it and uh, put it into his uh, mouth and Umar ibn Khattab took it out and threw it back into the, the carpet, and he began to cry. One of the Sahaba said, why are you crying when Allah has blessed you with so much wealth and power? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, has given you so much izzah and, and victory. Why are you crying? So uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Umar said, I heard the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say that any time Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opens up uh, blessings and rizq upon a people, animosity and hatred appears amongst them. Animosity and hatred appears amongst them. Okay? And subhanAllah, how true is this, by the way? That the most generous people are who? The poorest people. And the richer you get and the more greedy you get, the more stingy you get. Right? And this is what our Prophet is saying, that when you get, when society becomes more and more and more affluent, they actually get more stingy. And when society is living simple lives, they actually are more generous. And they give more, even though they don't have that much, right? So this is why Umar is, is crying, is that he feels that the Ummah is going to change. And boy, did it change, right? 
He feels that the good times are going to be going away. The generosity is going to be going away. We're now going to be, uh, uh, we're worried that people are going to get more greedy. And so he begins to cry, thinking this is going to happen. And of course, um, in essence, that is indeed uh, what happens. Uh, the next hadith that we're going to do is, uh, we did this before as well, that Ibn Abdullah ibn Abbas said that I heard the prophets, I heard Umar ibn Khattab say that when Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul died, remember Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul, right? When Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul died, the Prophet was called to make janazah over him. So he stood in front of him to make the janazah and when he was walking towards the, the, the body, I stood in front of the janazah. Meaning between the Prophet and the body, right? And I said, Ya Rasulullah, a'ala adu wallahi Abdullah ibn Ubay to salli. Are you going to make salah for the enemy of Allah, Abdullah ibn Ubay? And that day he did this, and that day he did this, and Umar says, and I began to mention all that he had done. And all the while the Prophet was smiling at me. All the while the Prophet was smiling at me. Then when I continued my list, the Prophet ﷺ said, Akhir anni ya Umar. Get away, O Umar. Get away from the path. I'm going to pray. Because Allah has given me the choice and I've made my choice. What is the choice? The choice is Surah Tawbah verse 80. And, Allah, and the Prophet ﷺ quoted it. Istaghfir lahum aw la tastaghfir lahum. In tastaghfir lahum sab'ina marratan falan yaghfir Allahu uh, lahum. Pray or don't pray. Even if you were to pray 70 times, Allah is not going to forgive over this munafiq. Okay? But what is the beginning? Pray or don't pray. And he said, I have chosen to pray. Because our Prophet was merciful. Even Abdullah ibn Uwe ibn Salul, he didn't want him to be punished. Even the head of hypocrisy, the one who had caused Uhud, the one who had said what he had said when they're coming back, uh, that, uh, Remember we talked about this, right? The one who had done so much harm, and who had even begun the slander, even him, still, our Prophet is the one who sent as a mercy for all of mankind. Rahmata lil alameen. So he wanted to make salah for Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul. So, Umar went out and the Prophet ﷺ prayed for him and he went to his qabr and he finished the whole process. Umar said, I became embarrassed at my, at my uh, jur'ah, um, what's the word of jur'ah as in, in English would be my, my impudence, right? Being impudent, just like me, I, I shouldn't have been so harsh, right? That who am I? to stand in front of the Prophet ﷺ and tell him, don't pray for Abdullah ibn Ubayy ibn Salul. And it was only a matter of time before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the next verse, وَلَا تُصَلِّ عَلَىٰ أَحَدٍ مِّنْهُمْ مَا تَأَبَدًا وَلَا تَقُمْ عَلَىٰ قَبْرِ Never pray for any one of them after this, the munafiqeen, and never go and stand at their grave, because he had prayed and stood at their uh, grave. And so, Umar ibn Khattab said, the Prophet ﷺ never did another salah for any munafiq after that ayah came down. Okay, so that was the last time that uh, a munafiq was prayed over. Uh, the next hadith uh, is the famous one of uh, Abbas ibn Rabi'ah that I saw Umar ibn Khattab doing tawaf and he kissed the, yam, the Hajar al-Aswad and when he kissed it, he said, Ama wallahi, I swear by Allah, I know you are just a rock. You cannot harm me or benefit me. And were it not for the fact that I saw the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam kiss you, I would not have kissed you. Now, of course, we believe that the Hajar al-Aswad uh, is the only original stone from the time of Ibrahim Alayhi Salam. All the other stones of the Kaaba come and go and come and go. But the Hajar al-Aswad is the original stone and that our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam kissed it. And therefore, we kiss it because he kissed it. Otherwise, it is a stone. It does not, it of course, have any inherent divinity, anything like this. But it is just the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam to do that. Uh, the next hadith that uh, we are going to do is the uh, hadith of uh, Huwaitib ibn Abdul Uzza, uh, who narrates that Abdullah ibn Saadi said that uh, I came to Umar ibn Khattab when he was in charge, 
and he put me in charge of a task, meaning he employed me. The government or the Khilafah employs him. So I did his deed. Then he gave me my, my salary, meaning whatever was, was, uh, was assigned to him, he gave it to him. So uh, I, said, I said to Umar ibn Khattab, I don't want it, for I have plenty of wealth. I have cattle, I have horses, I have slaves, I have plenty of wealth. I don't want your money. I did this for fi sabilillah. So Umar ibn Khattab said, don't say this and take the money. For I did the exact same thing that you did with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And when he gave me the money, I said, O Messenger of Allah, give the money to somebody who is more deserving of this than me. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, O Umar, take the money and invest it to get more money and then be charitable to the poor. Meaning, there's nothing wrong with taking the money and getting more money and then being charitable to the poor. And then he said, and this is a hadith by the way, it's a very famous hadith and it's a beautiful hadith. Anytime this money meaning the money of this world, comes to you without you asking for it, then take it. Because that is Allah's rizq that He has given it to you. Okay? So you're not greedy for it. You're not asking it. You have been given it. So then, this is your haqq, take it. And this hadith is beautiful because it shows us that there's nothing inherently wrong with obtaining pure money. You did a job, you get your money, and the Prophet is saying, he said this to Umar, take this money, tamawalhu, means invest it. Use it wisely, don't spend it in luxury items. Use it, invest it, go do some business. When you get it back, tasaddaq bihi. Give it to the poor, okay? So the good Muslim realizes money is a tool that is not inherently evil. It could be evil, but inherently it can be used for good. Because in the end of the day, how are you going to be charitable when you don't have money? So the hadith says, when the money comes to you without you asking and being greedy for it. This is your rizq. Allah has, Allah has given it to you. Rizqun Allah It's like Allah has directed it to your plate. So then take it and don't complain about it. So this hadith demonstrates for us that when you get your agreed upon salary or whatever it is, this is your haqq. You don't need to have, this is not piety to turn down money that you have earned. That's not piety. That's a false piety. Piety would be to turn away money that you have not earned. Money that is not rightfully yours. Money that is haram. You turn that away. But money that is yours, you have earned it. You have worked for it. It's not piety that you reject that money. We need money to live. We earn halal money. We get that money and then we spend it on the uh, poor. Uh, the, the next hadith that we'll do, it goes back to something we said two, three weeks ago, that Umar ibn al-Khattab once gave a khutbah, and in that khutbah he said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed things for his Prophet that he didn't allow for us. And the Prophet sallallahu has gone, and so I am commanding you that you perform hajj and umrah separately like Allah has commanded. And I'm commanding you to uh, take care of women permanently. Now, what is this a reference to? Who can remind me? We did this three weeks ago. Hajj tamattu' and nikah al muta. Do you remember these two things? Or do I have to remind you of them? Go ahead again. Okay. No problem. Hajj tamattu' What is hajj tamattu' Separate ihram for Umrah and Hajj, just like that. That means if I go for Umrah now, and then I come back to Memphis, and then I go for Hajj in August of 2016. Ah, exactly. See, that condition is very necessary. Or else, so Hajj tamattu is when you do Hajj and Umrah in the same journey with two ihrams. Okay? That's the definition. In the same journey, you do Hajj and Umrah. Now, Remember what did Umar al-Khattab say? I did this guys, didn't I do this? I'm positive I did this. Yes, I know I did this in the second or third one of Umar al-Khattab. Yeah, 
Mut'a wedding and tamattu'. I did both in the same lecture. The tamattu'. So Umar ibn Khattab decided for a reason we, we are still debating to ban tamattu' hajj. Yes, I covered this. I'm positive. That he decided we're not going to do tamattu' anymore. And the vast majority of scholars after him said that was a personal opinion and we're going to go back to tamattu', which is what all the four madahib have. Okay, all the former that have that we're going to go back to tamattu'. Okay, so Umar ibn Khattab said that was something Allah allowed for the Prophet. I don't think we need to do that. Do separate Hajj and Umrah, do not combine between Hajj and Umrah in the same journey. Okay, and he said, protect the chastity of your women. So he forbade the mut'a nikah. Remember the mut'a nikah, what it was, right? And of course, protect the chastity of your women because mut'a nikah does not protect women, does it? In, in Islam, when you marry, it's supposed to be a permanent marriage. If it breaks up, it breaks up, but you don't marry a temporary marriage. Okay? So, protect the chastity of your women. I don't allow you nikah al-mut'ah. And of course, nikah al-mut'ah was forbidden by the uh, Prophet <coughs> sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The next hadith, Umar ibn Khattab said, I asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that, is it allowed for a man to go to sleep in the state of Janaba? And the Prophet said, yes, if he does wudu. Yes, if he does wudu. Now, the vast majority of scholars have said that it is halal to go to sleep in the state of Janaba without wudu, but that's makru. Makru means you should avoid it. It's not haram, you're not sinful. Okay? If you want to sleep in the state of Janaba, you want to take a ghusl at fajr time, then the better thing to do at least is to just do wudu. Then it's you're totally fine, it's legit, it's mubah. And then you can delay uh, ghusl to fajr time. But, if you don't do wudu, and you sleep in the state of Janaba, you're not sinful, but you are not in the best state as well. It is something that is makruh to do. It's not something that is mubah, it's something that is makruh to do. So this hadith proves it, that the Prophet is not wanting us to do makruh. So when Umar says, can I sleep in the state of Janaba? The Prophet said, yes, as long as you have done wudu. Yes, as long as you have done uh, wudu. Uh, the next hadith that will do is a famous hadith that um, Umar ibn al-Khattab uh, was on his way to uh, Syria. And on the way to Syria, he was informed of the plague, the ta'un, that had taken place. So remember, there was a plague that had taken place. And uh, the, how serious it was. And when he heard this, uh, he then basically decided to go back. And when he returned, he said that had I gone to Syria or not gone and returned, it would not have changed my death in the eyes of Allah. Meaning, whenever Allah has decided my, I'm going to die, I'm going to die. But this was the command of the Prophet ﷺ, and this is what the Prophet ﷺ said. And this hadith is one of those amazing predictions, one of those amazing uh, realities that our Prophet ﷺ said that if one of you is in a land where a plague breaks out, do not leave, stay there. And if one of you is in a land, uh, uh, sorry, and if one of you is heading to that land but has not come, then go back to your land. This is a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. And we now know, of course, that plague spread when people leave the infested area. And this is exactly what the Prophet is saying. So Umar is not yet in the land. So he's obeying the process, but he's saying, even if I had gone, it's not going to change the ajal. It's not, not going to change what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has written uh, for me. And of course, that is something that is a uh, well-known uh, hadith and a well-known reality of our uh, religion. Uh, the next hadith Ibn Abbas narrated that many of the Sahaba said to me, and the most trustworthy in my eyes is Umar ibn Khattab, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, there is no salah after Asr until the sun sets, and there is no salah after Fajr until the sun rises. And this hadith is in Bukhari and Muslim, and it's narrated by Umar ibn Khattab. Actually, it's narrated by Ibn Abbas, and he's saying, I heard this from many Sahaba, and the, most, the one that I trust the most is Umar. So this is the famous hadith, there is no salah after Asr until the sun sets, and there is no salah after Fajr until the sun uh, rises. Uh, the next hadith, that... Umar ibn Khattab said that I heard the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam forbid us from swearing by our forefathers. 
So I, I swear by Allah, ever since I heard the Prophet ﷺ say that, I have never once sworn by my forefathers. And in fact, I haven't even narrated the act of swearing by one's forefathers. Meaning, if you're telling a story, and in the story, the character says, and I swore by my forefather, he said, even that I haven't done. Not even narrated that somebody has done that. I have not done that. Now, of course, in our Sharia, when you give an oath, you swear. You have to swear by Allah or one of the attributes of Allah. We do not say, I swear by my father or forefathers, but the Arabs would say that, the Jahili Arabs. They would give an oath, and the oath would be, I swear by my forefather. Now, again, this goes back to a point of the fiqh or sharia, that when you give an oath, when you give an oath, the point of the oath is you invoke someone or something that is so sacred and holy that the other person will not doubt you. Like, you're, it's too sacred. You're not going to lie. And in our Sharia, there's only one being that is that sacred. And that is our Lord. Okay? That is why we don't even give an oath by our Prophet ﷺ. We don't even give a qasam by our Prophet ﷺ. We don't say, I swear by Muhammad ﷺ. No. We say, I swear by Allah or you can use the name and attribute of Allah, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, or anything, that's fine. But you cannot give a qasam, an oath, in any other, by any other entity or being, because no one else deserves that level of sanctity, other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why uh, our Prophet ﷺ said, whoever is going to give an oath, let him swear by Allah or let him be quiet. Do not swear by your forefathers. So, Umar al-Khattab is saying, I never swore... Uh, after, uh, uh, by, by, by the forefathers after that, even if it was basically narrating, uh, even if it was narrating the story. Uh, the next hadith on Uqba ibn Amir, that he said, uh, that, uh, that, he, that Umar ibn Khattab said that they left with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Uqba ibn Amir is narrating his, his, his hadith, that I left with the Prophet sallallahu in the ghazwa of Tabuk, and one day, one morning, the Prophet ﷺ began narrating uh, to us. And of the things that he said is this hadith. This is a famous hadith that uh, whoever uh, stands up to pray after the sun has risen and he does wudu and he perfects his wudu and he prays two rak'at, all of his sins will be forgiven. Uh, and he will be like the day his mother gave birth to him. Now pause here. This is about the one who prays fajr and he stays and he does dhikr and he... Uh, praises Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Then he prays Salat al-Duha Salat al-Duha He prays it So this person The Prophet said All of his sins will be forgiven If you perfect Salat al-Duha After you prayed Fajr And then you basically uh, Pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Your sins will be forgiven And Uqba said I said after this Alhamdulillah Who has allowed me to hear this From the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Umar ibn al-Khattab Was sitting next to me And he said are you amazed at this hadith? For verily, I heard a hadith that is more pleasing to me than that one. I heard something even better than this. So Uqba said, tell me, what is this hadith? So Umar said, I heard the Prophet sallallahu say, whoever does wudu and he perfects his wudu and he raises his head to the skies and he says, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika la wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluh all of the eight gates of jannah are open for him and he can enter from whichever one he pleases so isn't it easier to do wudu and say the dhikr than to pray two rak'ahs after fajr right so umar is saying i have a better hadith than this and so that's the point that they are basically and both of these hadith are uh, beautiful both of these hadith are ones that we can um, benefit from uh, and uh, of the hadith as well of Jabir ibn Abdullah that he said, Umar ibn Khattab said to me that I heard the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam say, a time will come when a group of people will pass by the peripheries of Medina and they will say, inside here there used to live a lot of believers once upon a time. What is this hadith indicating? there will be a lack of inhabitants of Medina. This is predicted in many ahadith, Bukhari and Muslim, that one of the signs of Yawm Al-Qiyamah is Medina will be uninhabited. And when will that take place? 
after the Dajjal. After the Dajjal. Because when Dajjal comes, Medina will be safe. Right? So after the Dajjal, there will come a time when Mecca and Medina both will be uninhabited. They will be in ruins. Completely in ruins. And this is the reference here. That Umar ibn Khattab is saying, I heard the Prophet say, a time will come when caravans will go by and they'll pass by Medina and they'll say, there used to be Muslims who live there. Right? So Medina will remain inhabited from the time of the Prophet until the very end of times. And that will be then the, uh, uh, right before the Qiyamah. And that's something that is mentioned in uh, Bukhari and Muslim and other hadith as well. Uh, and the next hadith will do that Umar al-Khattab said that one day the Prophet was distributing uh, the wealth to the people. And Umar said, Ya Rasulullah, there are people who deserve this more than these people you're giving. The people of the Sufa, Ahl al-Sufa. Ahl al-Sufa, why don't you give it to them? So... The Prophet Sallallahu said, You are putting me between two situations. Either these people that are in front of me will be forced to ask with greater uh, begging or that they will accuse me of being stingy. And I am not a stingy person. Meaning, O oh Umar, I know best what to do and I need to give to these people as well. Because if I don't give to them, these are the Bedouins. These are the people. So Umar al-Khattab is saying, why are you giving to these Bedouins? Give to the people of the Sufa. They are more deserving. And the Prophet is saying, if I don't give to them, then they will resort to being even more persistent in how they ask. And then they're going to accuse me of being stingy. And I'm not a stingy person. So I'm going to give to them. And that's the, uh, the point here is that the Prophet knows best basically uh, who to give it to. Uh, the next hadith that we're going to do is uh, Umar ibn Khattab said, when the Prophet ﷺ passed away, the Ansar said, we're going to have two leaders, one from us and one from you. So I said to them, O people of the Ansar, don't you know that the Prophet ﷺ appointed Abu Bakr to lead the prayer? So who amongst you is going to be happy that you lead Abu Bakr in prayer. Look at how he refuted them. Right? You all know that Abu Bakr is our Imam in Salah. If one of you were to be the Amir, who amongst you would like that Abu Bakr is behind him? So they said, we seek Allah's refuge from ever standing in front of Abu Bakr. And that was the end of that. And we know what happened when this the uh, Saqifah Banu Sa'ada took place, that Umar al-Khattab basically said to them, you can't have two leaders. You have to have one, and it has to be Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. And that is exactly what um, happened. Uh, of the um, hadith as well, uh, of the hadith as well that we're going to do is the next one, <clears throat> that Umar al-Khattab said, I agreed with my Lord in three things. I agreed with my Lord in three things. Number one, I said to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, O Messenger of Allah, why don't you pray behind the Maqam Ibrahim? And Allah revealed in the Quran, وَاتَّخِذُ مِن مَقَامِ إِبْرَاهِيمَ مصلى. Pray behind the Maqam Ibrahim. Number two, I said, Ya Rasulullah, your wives, people that are good and people that are bad, they both enter upon them. So why don't you command them with hijab? And so Allah revealed Ayatul Hijab. And number three, that once the uh, wives of the Prophet ﷺ came complaining about something, and, uh, and this was the famous incident we did in the seerah, uh, that the whole month long issue that took place, and I said, and this is exactly what he said to his daughter Hafsa, exactly what he said, that Asa Rabbuhu in Talaqa Kunna Yabdullahu Azwaj and Khairam in Kun. That if you are divorced, uh, that his Lord will choose for him wise better than you. He said this to his own daughter, because his daughter was one of the wives, right? And what he said, literally, in essence, it was revealed later on. Okay? So he's saying, I agreed with Allah in three matters. I agreed with Allah in three matters. Now, of course, he is being, of course, polite here. What he's trying to say is, I said three things, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then confirmed the truth of what I said. That is what the, the meaning of this uh, hadith is. Uh, the next hadith is the famous hadith that is uh, a very beautiful one for all of us that I heard the Prophet ﷺ say, 
continue frequenting between Hajj and Umrah because continually repeating the Hajj and Umrah expels poverty and sins from you just like a furnace expels impurities and dirt. dirt. In other words, don't be happy with one Hajj and one Umrah. Keep on going for Hajj and Umrah. Keep on going for Hajj and Umrah and that will expel from you poverty and uh, dirt. Uh, the next hadith is of course the most famous hadith of Umar ibn Khattab. This is the most famous hadith of Umar ibn Khattab. It is the first hadith of Bukhari. And it is إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَّاتِ وَلِكُلِّ مْرِئِ مَّا نَوَى فَمَنْ كَانِتْ هِجْرَةُ إِلَى اللَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلْ فَهِجْرَةُ إِلَى مَا هَاجَرَ إِلَيْهِ وَمَنْ كَانِتْ هِجْرَةُ لِدُنْيَا يُصِيبُهَا أَوْ مْرَأَةٍ يَنْكِحُهَا فَهِجْرَةُ إِلَى مَا هَاجَرَ إِلَيْهِ This is the most famous hadith, إنما الأعمال بالنيات. It's the first hadith of Bukhari, and it is the hadith only narrated by Umar. Nobody else narrated this hadith. This is the famous hadith of uh, Infiradat Umar, i.e. only Umar narrated this hadith, and it translates as, all actions will be judged by intentions and every person will only achieve what he or she intended and uh, i comment on this all the time that i say the only system in which you are rewarded for what you desired and not what you achieved is the system of islam only allah azza wa jal will look at your inner heart everybody else will look at what you've done your boss doesn't care about your niyyah your teacher and professor doesn't care how much efforts you put in. He cares about what you did in the exam, right? Only Allah, because Allah knows the heart, doesn't care about what you achieve. He cares about what's in here. And that's the hadith of Umar al-Khattab. That actions are only judged by intentions. The whole judging is based on what you wanted. And the actual result and the actual success is really irrelevant. What matters to Allah is what's inside, not what's outside. And this hadith of Umar is of course the first hadith in our Sahih Bukhari and it's a hadith all of us are aware of. So the same deed could be done and you can have the highest of rewards or you can have a punishment or zero rewards. So your hijrah can be for Allah and His Messenger and your hijrah can be for business or marriage. Whoever is was for Allah and His Messenger will get Jannah. And whoever was, was for business and marriage, he will get whatever he wanted. Right? So, and of course, this was in reference to um, a person from Mecca who emigrated to Medina uh, only to marry a lady from Medina. And they became, some of the, the Muhajirun said, will he get the rewards that we're getting? That's not fair. He didn't come with our sacrifice. He didn't have to give up. He wasn't persecuted. Will he get what, what we're getting? And so the Prophet uh, said this famous. Um, hadith. Uh, the uh, next hadith that we're going to do is the uh, hadith of uh, Umar al-Khattab that the Prophet said, Al-Waladu lil-Firash, the famous hadith, two words, Al-Waladu lil-Firash. This is a max maxim of fiqh. It has become a maxim of legal ruling. Al-Waladu lil-Firash. The child shall as be ascribed to the bed it was born in. Meaning, we do not bring in any doubt. Any child that is born to an official marriage, the child is that marriage's child. The son and the, the, will be the, of the father and whatnot. And of course in Jahiliyyah, they had other systems. In Jahiliyyah, there were techniques that if a father denied the paternity of his child, he could do this, he could do that, right? And in Islam, no, we don't care about anything other than the firash, the, the nikah. If the nikah is valid, we get rid of doubt. And this is the purpose of the hadith, al-waladu lil-firash. We don't open this door. Uh, and we assume the best. And as you know, the famous hadith, not related to this one, but uh, a man came to the process, of, or not in this wording, a man came to the process and said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, my uh, son was born and he has a different skin color than me. And the Prophet Sallam said, that, do you have camels? He said, yes. So he said, what color are they? So he said, red. So he said, is there any that is darker than that? He said, yes, I have one that is dark. So he said, where did that darkness come from? So the man said, maybe it was a blood vein of one of them. That's what they thought. Maybe there was a blood vein of one of the mothers that would be made this one dark. So he says, so this too, it was the blood vein of one of the mothers. Okay? Meaning, don't think too much. Don't accuse your wife without any evidence. Okay? 
That's another issue of modern fiqh And that's a separate issue What are modern fuqaha going to do with that And that's a valid question That's a valid question But the point is that We expel doubt as much as possible And we Al-waladu uh, lil-farash As our Prophet Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said uh, The next hadith Which is very beneficial for all of us Which always comes up the same thing That A man came to Umar ibn Khattab And I said And he said Allah says in the Quran that there is no sin on you to shorten your prayers when you are traveling if you are scared of being attacked. And he said, we don't have any fear right now of being attacked. So why do we shorten the prayers? So Ibn al-Khattab responded, I too was questioning this ayah exactly like you questioned it. And I asked the Prophet ﷺ exactly like you questioned me. And the Prophet ﷺ responded, Sadaqatun tasaddaq Allahu biha alaykum faqbalu sadaqatahu. This is a charity that Allah has given to you. So accept his charity. Meaning you don't have to be in a situation of fear. It's a charity. Allah has allowed you whenever you're traveling to make qasr. So accept his charity. So this is the hadith. And this shows you why you cannot just interpret the Quran without hadith. Because if you were to interpret the Qur'an without hadith, then, well, you would start a lot of problems, but of them is you would not do qasr. Because qasr is only allowed in the Qur'an with a clear two conditions. Number one, traveling. Number two, fear of attack. If you're fearful of attack, then shorten. And that condition has in essence been abrogated by this hadith. And the Prophet said it doesn't matter if you're scared, fearful or not, you are allowed to shorten the uh, salah. Uh, the next hadith is that when Umar was performing Umrah, uh, Qais ibn Marwan came to him from Kufa and he said that, O oh Umar, there is a man in Kufa who is dictating to us Qur'ans from his memory. In other words, we're not transcribing it from the copy. He's simply reciting and the students are dictating, writing around him. So Umar became so angry that you could see the anger in his face. And he said, tell me who he is. Wayhak, woe to you. Like this is a very big deal. Who is this man who dares to dictate to you the Quran? So he said, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. So Umar calmed down instantaneously and returned to the way he was. And he says, woe to you. Don't you know that I don't know of anybody who is more qualified to recite the Qur'an than Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. Let me tell you one thing that happened. One day, I was with the Prophet and Abu Bakr, and we were discussing something of the matters of the Muslims. So pause here. So the three of them are discussing how to, basically issues pertaining to the Ummah, and it goes late at night. And we walked outside, and there was a man praying in the masjid. And the Prophet paused to listen to his prayer. And we couldn't recognize him because of the darkness. But the Prophet ﷺ said, مَنْ سَرَّهُ أَنْ يَقْرَأَ الْقُرْآنَ رَطْبًا كَمَا أُنزِلْ and, and the other version, غَضًّا طَرِيًّا كَمَا أُنزِلْ فَلْيَقْرَأْ عَلَى قِرَاءَةِ إِبْنِ أُمِّ عَبْدِ Whoever wants to recite the Qur'an fresh as it came down, just like it was revealed, let him recite upon the recitation of Ibn Ummi Abd. Now Ibn Ummi Abd, the son of the mother of the, of the Abd, and you don't know who this person is. Of course, this is how the process referred to Ibn Mas'ud, but Umar and Abu Bakr didn't recognize who is he. Okay, so uh, then he went on. So, uh, sorry, sorry, then that's not here. So then the man finished praying, and he raised his hands for dua, and every time he made dua, the Prophet ﷺ said, Sal tu'ta, sal tu'ta, whatever you ask, Allah will give you. Whatever you ask, Allah will give you. So Umar said, I will go to him as soon as I escort the Prophet back. I will come rushing back and tell him the good news. That the Prophet praised his qira'ah and the Prophet said, whatever you ask, you will be given. So I rushed back, meaning after they went and they dropped the Prophet, I rushed back to the masjid and I found Abu Bakr was already there speaking with him. <laughs> telling him all that I wanted to tell him. وَوَاللَّهِ مَا سَابَقْتُهُ إِلَىٰ خَيْرٍ قَطْ إِلَّا سَبَقَنِي إِلَيْهِ 
I never tried to race Abu Bakr except that he won me in the race. Okay, so this is one of those beautiful hadith, right? Narrated at Arafat, where we, again, that's why I like to read these types of a hadith, because you just get all of this mix, right? You get a bit of Umar's time, you get a bit of the Prophet's time, so that's where it's really beneficial. I, I, I like it personally, and something that, inshallah, I hope you also agree with me, it's just beneficial to go over some of these um, a hadith. Um, the next hadith that we're going to do, I know uh, time is, is, is limited. Uh, the next hadith that we're going to do is the uh, hadith that, uh, this is one of my favorite hadith as well, and it was one, um, one of Umar's favorite incidents as well. That Umar ibn Khattab said that one time I asked the Prophet wasallam to go for Umrah. Ask permission, can I leave and go for Umrah? So the Prophet wasallam allowed me, and he said, Ya ukhayyu, la tansana min du'aika. And Umar said, nothing was more beloved to me in this whole world than what our Prophet ﷺ said, and that he called me Ukhay. Ukhay is Tasghir of Akhi, right? Ukhay is, hey, my little brother, okay? You say it when you want to show solidarity. You say it when you want to show closeness, okay? Friendship, Ukhay, my little brother, okay? And the Prophet said, Ya Ukhay, my little brother, don't forget to make dua for me. And how emotional this must be for Umar Khattab that the Prophet is saying, my little brother, and he's saying, when you go to Mecca, pray for me as well. And this shows us that it is completely permissible to ask somebody to make dua for you. Nothing, nothing is wrong. As long as you make dua for yourself as well. The problem comes when you don't make dua for yourself and then you only ask other people. That's a problem. Okay? But you make dua for yourself and you can say, go and make dua for me. It's not a problem. Nothing is wrong with that. So Umar al-Khattab said, nothing was more uh, beloved to me than uh, the Prophet calling me little brother and telling me to go make dua for uh, him. Uh, and we'll just do a few more hadith and we'll finish up. Umar al Khattab said that uh, the salah of the musafir is two, and the salah of Eid al Adha is two, and the salah of Eid al Fitr is two, and the salah of Jumu'ah is two. And all of these are considered complete and they are not shortened. And this is what the Prophet said. So, Jumu'ah, the two Eids. And whenever you're traveling, you pray only two, and you don't think that you've shortchanged, that is the salah. So simple, basic um, hadith. And then the final one that we'll do, inshallah ta'ala, uh, the final one that we'll do is the one that uh, I, wanted, I actually wanted to uh, conclude at this one, uh, is Umar ibn Khattab uh, that said that one, or sorry, it is narrated that once when the people of Yemen came to visit uh, Medina, Umar ibn Khattab entered in amongst them and said, are any of you from the uh, tribe of uh, Qaran? Are any of you from Qaran? And he finally found the tribe of Qaran. And he said to them, who are you? They said, we are uh, Qaran. And uh, Umar ibn Khattab continued to look amongst them until he saw a particular person and he held on to his saddle. And he said, what is your name? He said, Uwais. Uwais al-Qarni. This is Uwais. So, Umar said, you are the one that has a mother still alive. He said, yes. You are the one that was suffering from uh, a type of skin disease. Um, the, the skin, would, well, I don't know the medical term, but the skin has spots of whiteness everywhere. Uh, that type of thing, right? Hmm? Uh, vitiligo. So all of these spots of whiteness. He said, yes. So you are the one who made dua to Allah and he cured you except for one place in your body, on your stomach, uh, that you still have. He said, yes. Meaning, the, Umar is the one telling him who he is. So Umar said, in that case, ask Allah to forgive me. Istaghfirli. So Uwais said, Subhanallah, you are the one that should be asking, I should be, sorry, I should be the one asking you for istighfar, right? Rather than you asking me. Because you are the companion of the Prophet So Umar said, 
I heard the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say, Inna khayra tabi'een rajulun yuqalu lahu uwais. The best of all tabi'een will be a man by the name of uwais, who has a mother. And he will be suffering from these Al-Bayad is called in Arabic And it will all go away Except for a small uh, bit of it And he is going to be very righteous with his mother Barran biwalidati It's going to be good to his um, mother So when you meet him Then ask him to for- Ask Allah to forgive you So Umar al-Khattab is following the hadith and saying to always to ask Allah to uh, forgive him. And subhanAllah, this hadith is so beautiful because again, it demonstrates so many things. Of them is the predictions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And uh, with this, and I know the time is up, uh, for those that came late, I said that um, Umar ibn Khattab has narrated over 500 a hadith. And we cannot obviously do all of them. I just wanted to give a selection that I thought were a little bit more interesting. And in the process, we get an idea not only of the life and times of Umar, but also of uh, some of the ahadith that he uh, narrated. And inshallah ta'ala, this will be um, the conclusion, not the conclusion, but the, well, the conclusion of Umar al-Khattab. But then we will pause here, inshallah, for the winter break and then come back and begin in uh, January with uh, inshallah ta'ala Uthman ibn Affan Our new series of Uthman ibn Affan And as you know by now We are not going to go into too much detail About the fitan that took place Nonetheless we're going to have to cover it To a, to some level But we're not going to go too deep um, And then especially when we get to Ali We're going to have to radiallahu anhu, We're going to have to breeze over that Because there's no benefit uh, in, in going back to those uh, to those issues But we'll just do it in a manner That inshallah uh, we're not going to go too deep. So uh, this will be our uh, temporary break uh, for the holidays. And inshallah ta'ala, we will resume uh, in January of 2016.